I worship you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, music team, for leading us into the presence of the Lord. So good to have everybody in church, everybody that's visiting with us. And those of you that are from town, from out of town, we welcome you to our service tonight. And uh, it's especially great to have our uh, college students here. We've got Bible college students here. We've got community college. We've got our university students coming in for this year. And we welcome them. And it's so good to have all of these uh, young faces. The older you get, uh, the more you appreciate young faces. I don't have one of those anymore. Beverly and I were talking about faces and young faces and wrinkles and all that stuff coming here, actually. I'm not going to tell you who was complaining the most about wrinkles. Um, actually, the Lord answered a prayer. We were talking about the fact on the way here that there are no cookies or cake or anything in our house. I won't tell you who was complaining about that either. The Lord answered a prayer. Rob came over, and Rob and Cheryl sent me some fudge. It's sitting right over there on the pew, and if anybody touches it, I will rebuke you soundly. Where's my wife? I was telling her, I was quoting scripture to her, all the fat is the Lord's. I was, I was, I was preaching to that lady. She told me, well, it was God's. I wasn't supposed to have any, but anyway, whatever. People twist scripture and just mess it all up. Uh, it's good to have a couple of my uncles here. My Uncle Ross and my Uncle Lesper are here. It's great to have them here. Love them both. <laughs> Go ahead and be seated. Um, I want to read a verse, but I just want to kind of give you a little bit of a, uh, an introduction to the verse because I'm going to take it out of context. And you shouldn't do that. Uh, you should never take a verse out of context, but I'm going to just kind of uh, slightly take it out of context. Um, and, and, and sometimes people take verses out of context and, and they preach the right thing. They just preach it from the wrong verse. I've mentioned this one a hundred times here. Uh, Proverbs 18 and 16. Uh, I guarantee some of these Bible college students, somebody will pray this over them this year. Uh, a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Your gift is going to make room for you. The only problem with that is that scripture is talking about bribery. Uh, that if you have money, you can pay off, you know, the king, and you can get an audience with the king. So uh, there's other verses in the New Testament that talk about stir up the gift that's in you and, and, and all of that kind of business. So we can talk about gifts, but not, not from that verse. And, and then you've probably all heard the old story, and to hear it told, you would think it happened in New Brunswick. I don't think it did, but they told about this guy that was looking for direction, uh, and he did something that was really bad at one time uh, th that you probably shouldn't do. He just uh, said, Lord, I need, I need some direction, so I, I'm going to just close my eyes and flip open my Bible and go like this. I wouldn't recommend that for direction. Now, it may work. God's a merciful God, but, uh, but people can also be pretty dumb. And uh, he put his finger on the Bible. He opened his eyes, and he looked down, and it was uh, Matthew 27 and 5. Uh, Judas went and hanged himself. And uh, he didn't feel real good about that direction, so he just prayed again, and he flipped a couple pages, and he did that again. And he landed on uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 37, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> and so he still didn't feel real good about direction, so he flipped a few more pages, and he did it again, and uh, he landed on uh, John chapter 13, verse 27, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> so I wouldn't suggest that as a great way to find the will of God for your life. Um, and, and there's all kinds of ways to take Scripture out of context. Uh, 1,812 times, there's one little phrase in the Bible, uh, it came to pass. 1,812 times. It's in there a lot. It came to pass. And uh, one little old lady, she got up to testify, and she said, I've been reading in my Bible. She said, I had a lot of trouble, and I'm just glad the Lord told me through his word. I see it everywhere. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. <laughs> That's not exactly what that means. Um, so... I'm going to take, with permission and explanation, I'm going to take a verse slightly out of context by, uh, by inflection tonight. Psalm 107, uh, verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Verse 2, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east and the west and the north and the south 
Now, back in the past, they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. They were hungry and thirsty, and their soul fainted in them. And then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses, and he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. And then this is the first of four times in this psalm that the psalmist says this, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. He says that three other times in that psalm. I want to take verse 2 and just the first phrase, and I'd like to put a little twist on it uh, tonight. Uh, and and I, I'm i preaching slightly out of context on this verse, but I'm preaching in context with the counsel of the word of the Lord. Uh, so I need your help. Um, everybody say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now if you'd say it this way. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, can I get you to do that? Let the redeemed of the Lord say, no, 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 no. You got to put like three question marks and four exclamation marks behind it. So, you know, you've said that to somebody before. Some of you said it to your kids today when they were whining and complaining and you said, so. So, let the redeemed of the Lord say, so. Yeah, we're coming. See, if you were ever a kid who was tormented by a bully and you couldn't come up with a snappy comeback to put him or her in, in their place, you may have just resulted, or you must may have just resorted to that one word. It was all your feeble mental faculties could come up with. So? And the word so has an incredibly long list of applications in the English language. It can actually be used as several parts of speech. You don't need to know this. This is useless information. This would be a good time to tune out of the sermon. It can be used as an adverb, a conjunction, a pronoun, an adjective, and several other parts of speech. But my favorite and its most powerful use, I think, is as an interjection. When you use it that way, so, it is a powerful term of dismissal and indifference and disinterest and even contempt. When you use it that way, so, it means why should that be considered significant at all? Your kids give you all kinds of excuses as to why they should be allowed to buy that and have that and go there and do that. And you say, so, or maybe your kids use it at you and that's why you're being so quiet. So when you use it with three exclamation marks and about a half a dozen uh, question marks, it means so what? Let the redeemed of the Lord say, so what? Now, you think I'm taking that scripture out of context, but, but really I'm not because there is another word in scripture uh, that kind of means so what. And so that verse is out of context, but these verses are not. This word is a longer word. It's a King James word that came into English, and we still use it today. Maybe you've used this word recently, uh, but we don't use it a lot. It's the word nevertheless. Let me say, nevertheless. Now, you'll remember so better than you'll remember nevertheless. But nevertheless is the same thing. Nevertheless kind of works like a bridge. It connects two ideas. And the first idea is powerful, and the first idea could be argumentative, and the first idea could suggest a whole lot of facts as to why you're in a problem, but nevertheless basically looks at the facts and looks at the problem and looks at the issue and says, so? Nevertheless, let me introduce you, the facts, to the truth because, ladies and gentlemen, God's truth is more powerful than your facts. It doesn't matter what life is thrown at you or what a diagnosis says or, or what your current situation is. I know that may be facts. But God's truth is stronger than facts. And that's what nevertheless does. It's a, a word bridge. It, it's, it admits that there's a point over here, but your point is not going to be enough. Your facts are not going to be enough to lessen God's truth over here. So nevertheless is that firewall between facts and God's truth. They're not the same. Nevertheless, it says what you just said might be so. The facts I'm looking at might be true. It might be exactly as the devil has stated or threatened. But all the devil's threats and all the facts of my circumstance lack the strength to assail the truth of God in my life. 
So nevertheless is a very efficient word in Scripture. It's like a stop sign. It's like putting on the brakes. Whatever facts the world has, whatever threats the devil has, I cannot be shaken from the truth that I know. The facts may be this, nevertheless the truth says that. The facts may have this outlook and this prognosis, nevertheless the truth of God still says stands sure. So really, when you use the Bible word nevertheless, it's kind of like saying to the devil, so? Let me give you a couple illustrations. I'm not going to be long tonight. Um, These uh, words in Matthew 7, verse 15, where Jesus said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening Wolves. That phrase, those words in Matthew 7, 15, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, that didn't come from some uh, news commentator or comedian or some modern philosopher. They came from Jesus because Jesus knew something and his disciples knew something that the enemies of truth, they run in packs. They're like wolves in sheep's clothing. And Paul anticipated, he said it in Acts 20, verse 29 and 30. He anticipated that after he died, there would be this onslaught from hell against the infant church. And there would be some false brethren even, armed with personality and education and charisma and intellect. But mostly they would be armed with ravenous appetites like wolves to try to devour the faith of defenseless young saints. Here's what he said. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you and they won't spare the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Paul said there's going to be two forces that are going to attack the faith of the saints. There's going to be wickedness in culture that's going to press in on the church and there's also going to be some false teachers and false preachers that are going to arise up from within and 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 these people are cowardly for the most part. They 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 try to get the young and the innocent away from the fold just like a wolf so they can pounce on them with their mockery and with their arguments and with their intimidation. And our society today and our culture that's so loose and lax, it loves these kinds of people. It loves people who are so tolerant and sophisticated and liberal and they can even call themselves Christians but they never call anything a sin. They never say anybody's not going to heaven. They're just, everybody's just one big hodgepodge and that's the world that we face but don't get depressed about it. That's the world that the first century church faced when God started the church and the disciples preached and Paul said, after my departing, there's going to be all these forces against the church. And so young Christians, you got to watch out because it's kind of like ravenous wolves, ravening wolves. They come in and they want to devour and they want to attack. And they won't have any kind of Christian conviction. They, they just kind of want to tear up what God has done in your life. I want to speak a word to our new believers in this church. Sometimes you go back to your job or you go back to your home, you go back to your friends or you go back to your family and you're made to feel like an idiot because you now have an experience with God. And you're made to feel like a freak because you live a lifestyle that is pleasing to God. The tragedy is not so much that it's in our society and it's the late night comedians and it's all the, you know, all the, the movies and the Hollywood scene and whatever. It's not that. It's sometimes all of these uh, so-called uh, Christians and they've got some kind of pseudo uh, belief or pseudo freedom or whatever. And, and sometimes people who call themselves Christians can be the most merciless on some of you new believers because they want to tell you that you don't need to do all that. Uh, you're, you're just a little too far out in your worship and you're just a little too far out in your commitment and you're just a little weird in your lifestyle. You don't need to do all of that. That's the same dynamic that the first century church faced. And in such an antagonistic religious atmosphere as we face today, when there's no absolutes and when Christianity is quick 
quickly becoming the only safe intolerance in our political world. Young believers need something that puts steel in their backbone and fortifies them against that kind of culture and that kind of society and that kind of lukewarm Christianity. If you're going to be an apostolic believer in this day and age, you're not going to do that easily. You're not going to do that without resistance. You're not going to do that without somebody pushing back and slapping back against you. So what you really need is an irrefutable, undebatable answer that just dismisses that kind of adversary. You need an indisputable, uh, inarguable answer that just kind of gives you a little bit of strength. And that answer, which, by the way, infuriates those kinds of people, is when you look back at them and say, yeah, you got a point. Nevertheless, you got, an, you, you got a point. I see your point. So what? Well, that drives them crazy. Now, you could find yourself, there are a lot of people that have educated themselves to attack Christianity today. Uh, you people that are in college, you're going to meet up with some of them and you try to defend your faith and you try to tell them why Jesus is real and why the Bible's true and why it's worth living for God and sometimes you'll come up against somebody that has spent years honing their arguments to debate you and your faith. They have such an edge on It's amazing to me that nobody is honing these kinds of arguments against Muhammad and nobody is practicing these kinds of arguments against Buddha. And nobody is sitting around writing books to defy many of the other religions of the world. It's not happening. Why Christianity? Because Jesus said something that none of them said. They said, follow me and I'll show you truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so that's why you run into those arguments sometimes. And no matter how anointed or how spiritual or how prayerful or how bright or how well prepared you are, you may eventually come up against somebody that's got a really good argument. So you need to arm yourself, especially if you're a young believer, with let the redeemed of the Lord say. I'm not talking about blind faith. There's lots of proof for the Bible. I'm not talking about blind obedience. There's lots of ways that you can look at, at history and you can look at science and you can look at every field and you can prove the existence of God and you can prove the truth and the uniqueness of the Word of God. But you're not going to have time to do all of that because usually those kinds of people take a pot shot at you and then walk off and leave you like... And so every once in a while you need a quick answer. Well, here's the quick answer. So, wait until they've used up all their energy and exhausted all their intellectual ammunition and they stand triumphant over you and they look down on you and think, well, they've beat you silly. And they say, what do you have to say about that? And you say this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth Sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Here's what you don't understand with all your intellectualism. You don't understand that I know God and God knows me. You don't understand. Nevertheless, you may have a point. You may have some facts. You may have an argument. But guess what? You've got an argument. I've got an experience with God. And, and so the Lord knows them that are his, and I happen to know God. So uh, your facts may be quite impressive. Your arguments may be quite convincing. But you've left out the one piece of the puzzle. It's the same as somebody trying to argue with me that I don't love Beverly. I can give you all kinds of answers and we can argue back and forth and I can say, well, I said this to her or I did this or, or whatever and we can argue back and forth but the plain fact is they don't have an argument that's great enough to tear down the experience that I have that I'm in love with that precious lady. So it's the same with Jesus. When it gets to the end of the day, spout off and spew all your facts but at the end of the day, 
Jesus not only changed my life, he's in my life. I talk to him. <laughs> nevertheless. Somebody say, nevertheless. Somebody say, so? That's your facts, but this is my truth. Nowhere in the Bible, by the way, does Scripture promise Christians a life of ease. God never promised us that it would always be easy to serve God. And in fact, there's some scriptures say the exact opposite, like this one. This is not in your Bible promise box, probably. This is not probably one you put on your mirror or on your fridge. Psalm 34, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's probably not a verse you're going to get up claiming every day. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But there is a second half to Psalm 34 and verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. And we don't understand that. We don't understand why God lets us sometimes walk through situations that we don't understand. We don't understand why God lets us go into trials that are so deep and so dark and, and so tough and we just don't understand that. And sometimes you're going to face it. It's not this time a question from outside or somebody attacking your faith. Sometimes, isn't it true that the questions come from inside? Isn't it true sometimes that it's you doing the questioning? God, I don't understand why you allowed this. I don't understand why this is happening. God, I've tried to be faithful and I've tried to believe and I've tried to hold on, but it seems like the more I pray, the more it goes in reverse. And, and sometimes God's dealings with humanity, even his own people, defy our cozy little explanations of faith. And in those times when it seems like it's turned upside down. And in those times when you don't even understand why God's allowing it, you couldn't explain it to anybody. You think God should have delivered you out of it months ago. You think God should have healed that weeks ago. You think that God should have done something different and you don't understand it. That's about the time that the devil will come to you and he's practiced longer than the atheists have practiced and he's practiced longer than the cynics have practiced. He's practiced for thousands of years and he never misses an opportunity to come into the life of a child of God and say, that's your God for you. He lets you work like a slave and he lets you pray without ceasing and he lets you pour out your heart and he lets you give till you drop and then after all of that, he rewards you with trials. He rewards you with sickness. He rewards you with suffering. He rewards you with all of that. And, and the devil is cruel and he's crafty and he's cunning and he'll look at you and, and he'll get in your mind. He'll, he'll talk in your ear. Can you deny that? And, and you're just like, no. I can't deny that I'm sick and I can't deny that I'm suffering and I can't deny that, that it seems like people have forsaken me. I can't deny any of that. And The devil will stand over you, just threaten you. So what do you got to say to that? You prayed and God didn't answer your prayer. What do you got to say to that? That you've been faithful and, and, and you don't have any money. What do you got to say to that? that? That you've been doing everything you know to do and it seems like your life is upside down. What do you got to say? And that's the time you need to look back at the devil and say, I just got one thing to say. I don't understand it. I don't even like it. I, I, I'm not in favor of it. If I had a vote, I'd vote against it. But I've got one thing to say. I'm not going to lift up my hand or my voice against my God. I'm going to say with Job, though he slay me, I'm still going to trust him. I got one word to say to you, and it's nevertheless. It may be true that I'm sick. Nevertheless, my God is a healer. It may be true that I haven't got my answer yet. Nevertheless, I I serve a prayer answering God. It may be true that I can't explain my circumstance. Nevertheless, he walks with me. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. So yeah, I got an answer, Mr. Devil. And the answer is so. Yeah, I don't understand it. So what if I don't understand it? I am not going to bow. I am not going to turn. I'm not going to walk away from my God. We need a gut check in the Pentecostal church. 
We, we really need to get the spirit of those three Hebrew boys that looked in the face of certain absolute destruction. We need to get a little gut check and do what they did. They looked at that king and they looked at that fiery furnace and they looked back at the king and they looked at the fiery furnace and they knew if they went in there, it was pretty much going to be certain death. And their answer, it echoes through the pages of Scripture and will echo into eternity. They say, King, our God is able to deliver us. Your fire's not big enough for our God. Your fire's not hot enough to overcome our God. So our God is able to deliver us. And then the next three words, but if not. What they did is they looked at the king and they said, so? I know you got a big fire. I, I, I know you're in control. I know you hold sway over our lives. And right now it looks like you hold all the cards and we don't have any. And we just got one thing to say. So what? We are still not going to bow, and we're still not going to turn away from God. Can I please speak to a Christian tonight who's in a problem, in a trial, in a deep valley, in a dark night of the soul? Can I please speak to you tonight? You need to get this in your spirit. I don't understand why God hasn't done it. I don't know why the answer hasn't come. I don't know why God hasn't turned it around. I don't know why I've got so much opposition and persecution. I don't know why I'm still pick one, lonely, depressed, uh, just, just hurting. I don't understand why that's still happening, but I've got this to say. God is able to heal me. God is able to bring my kids back. God is able to touch my body. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above everything that I'm praying for, and I know he can do it, but if he doesn't do it, I'm still not gonna bow. I'm still not gonna give up. I'm still not gonna stop worshiping God. Nevertheless, I'm still going to lift my hands. Nevertheless, I'm still going to lift my voice. Nevertheless, I'm still going to be faithful. Nevertheless, I'm still going to show up. Nevertheless, I'm still going to keep walking with God. Every once in a while, the redeemed of the Lord need to look at the devil and say, So what? Goodness. Paul did it, 2 Timothy, last book he'll ever write, verse 12 of chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1, 12. Paul said, Timothy, let me just be honest with you. For the cause of the gospel, I'm also suffering these things. Timothy, they throw me in jail. They've locked me up. They've bound me. I'm a captive. I'm going to die here. That's almost certain. Nevertheless, so what? Big deal. I know that I'm suffering. I know I'm a prisoner. I can't figure out why God doesn't let me free because if he'd let me free, I'd go start some more churches. If he'd let me out, I'd go preach some more sermons. If he'd let me out, I'd go find some more people and win them to God. But for purposes I don't understand, God has let me be in this prison. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed of my situation. I'm not trying to make excuses for me or excuses for God. For I know, Paul said, I've got two truths that balance out my circumstances. I've got two facts on God's side that cancel out and overcome the facts on the devil's side. And here they are. Number one, I know whom I have believed. I don't understand God's dealings with me. I don't understand what God is allowing in my life, but I know God. And so I know that my God can't be unjust. I know that my God God can't be unmerciful. I know that my God can't cancel out his grace. I know that my God is going to always treat me like a son or like a daughter. So here's what I know. I don't know anything about my circumstance. I can't define it. I can't explain it. But I know in whom I have believed. I know my God. Sometimes that's going to be all you got, young believer, is that you know that you know that you know that 
that Jesus did a work in your life and you can't explain why you're doing your best to serve God and you still don't have a job. You're doing your best to serve God and you still don't have your healing. You're doing your best to serve God and you still got opposition. You may not be able to explain any of that, but get yourself down in your spirit this word. Nevertheless, I know that's true. Nevertheless, I know my God is true. Oh, somebody give thanks to God. Music, come on back. Paul said, number one, I know whom I have believed. But number two, here's my other fact. In the middle of a deep, dark trial, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You can interpret that a lot of ways. Some people say, well, that's that God's able to keep my sins under the blood until that day because I committed them and that's a good interpretation. That's good. That's fair. But here's what I think Paul's saying. Paul's saying God keeps everything. I'm not keeping the books and the devil's not keeping the books and the world's not keeping the books. God keeps the books on my life. So I know in whom I have believed. I got that, but here's the other thing I've got. I'm persuaded that God's able to keep records. So there's nothing I'll walk through on this side of heaven that I won't get rewarded for when I get to heaven. There's no circumstance so bad or so dark here that it won't be rewarded a hundredfold over there. Now I know that's hard for us. We get so locked in to everyday living. But if you're a Christian, the longest, best, greatest part of your life is not here. The longest, best, greatest part of your life is not to your retirement or your funeral. The longest, best, greatest part of your life is when you take the first step on streets of gold and you're going to find out that the one you served here is there to meet you. And you're going to find out this. All of a sudden trials of the road seem like nothing. All the sacrifices you made seem like trivial stuff because when you get there, it's reward in the presence of God. Mm, Oh my goodness. So if you've ever felt unappreciated, if you've ever felt unnoticed, if you've ever felt like what you're doing for God is in vain, let me tell you on the authority of the Word of God, that eternity will be the great equalizer. I said at a funeral one time here in this pulpit, and I believe it with all my heart. Whoever the funeral was that we were doing, it seems like it was uh, Sister Lorna Bellier, but I can't remember for sure. And, And she'd had some physical challenges and difficulties that made it very difficult for her. She couldn't even get out to the house of God, and that bothered her a lot. And it was a season, whenever we did our funeral, it was a season when there was a whole lot of construction in Fredericton. That could be just about any season, to be honest. In fact, as soon as they see tourists coming, they shut down all the bridges and dig up all the roads. That's what I got figured out, at least. But we had a lot of detours and a lot of those crazy lights and people stopping us and one lanes. If you're meeting friends at a restaurant after church, and you go a different direction than they go. Uh, maybe they take the the turn that leads them to the road that's free of obstacles, and there's not many stoplights, and there's no bumps, and there's no construction. And they get to the restaurant a little sooner than you do. And you, you took like the downtown. You you get stuck here and stopped here and detoured here, and there was construction here and. You, you, you had your car just newly washed you drove it over some bumps and the dirt and the dust and whatever but you eventually get to the restaurant you just get there a little behind them and you had a little more inconvenience getting there now I'm not trying to be trite or trivial because people walk through terrible situations that are very painful and very hurtful but that's because we look at it through, a earthly, through an earthly perspective here's what I know when we get to heaven and we sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and we're in the presence of Jesus, the fact that one person had 
a disease for most of their life and another person was healthy. The fact that one person had more blessings or money or a nicer home and the other person didn't have very much while they served God. The fact that one person lived in a blessed country like Canada and one person lived in an impoverished African nation, but they were both apostolic Christians. When we get to heaven and we start to talk about our life stories, it's gonna be no different than getting to the restaurant and somebody saying, well, you took the long way around. It's going to be no worse. You see, you don't believe that because we can't see it right now, but that's how it's going to be. When we get to heaven, some through the water, some through the flood, some go through the fire, but the point is we all get there because we all go through the blood. That's all that matters by the time you get to heaven. So I know some Christians walk through trials and you just ache for them. Some Christians walk through circumstances and your heart breaks for them. But you got to get this in your spirit because the devil will mercilessly attack and he'll say, where's your God now, saint of God? you got to get it in your spirit. This is my sickness. This is my problem. This is my trial. This is my circumstance. Nevertheless, the promise of God, the the word of God, the covenant of God stands sure. The Lord knows me and I know him. Nevertheless, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that when I get to heaven, it's going to be God that kept the record books and it's all going to be okay. Just one more and, and we'll finish. This is in the Gospels. It's in Luke chapter 5. And it's Peter. Peter was a unique guy. He, um, he always thought he knew best. He's like a lot of us. And it's broad daylight in this story. And they're on the Sea of Galilee in broad daylight. And it's morning daylight. They've labored and worked hard and fished all night. They've caught nothing. And now a prophet named Jesus, a carpenter, from the landlocked village of Nazareth with no sea beside it is trying to tell them how to fish and they're not real happy about it. And so Peter looks at Jesus and he says this. Now, he, he's not going to be disrespectful to Jesus, but he'd kind of like to let everybody know that this is a really dumb idea. And so in Luke 5 and 5, Peter said to him, Master, I just want to let you know this is kind of dumb. We have toiled all the night and we've taken nothing. And then he says, nevertheless, so what? I know that it doesn't seem rational and I know that it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. But so what? At thy word, I will let down See, we often labor for God and work for God and walk with God under this illusion that all of our obedience to God is supposed to be joyful, like you're supposed to be feeling like a thousand percent all the time, that you're always supposed to be dancing and you're always supposed to have a great big grin on your face because you're always so full of happiness. And that's not the way it is all the time. There may be burdens placed in your life or demands placed in your life from the Lord that don't make much sense sometimes. And when that happens, go ahead, do what Peter did. Tell God how ridiculous it is that he's allowing this. Tell God how your plan would be better than his plan. God and I have those talks sometimes. I figure I could straighten out the whole world if God would just put me in charge for about five minutes. That's about all I would need. There wouldn't be much of a world left, but it would be straightened out, let me tell you. God's not upset when you explain to him why you know better than he does about your life. So let him hear it all. That's what prayer is for. Pour it all out. Tell him. I'm sure the Almighty will appreciate your advice. But when you're finished telling God why life makes no sense, when you're finished telling God why the miracle can happen, when you're finished telling God, make sure you add Peter's word on the end of your prayer or your explanation or your argument. Peter said, Master, this is crazy. 
we've fished all night, we've worked all night, we've toiled all night, and we didn't get anything. Nevertheless, so what? That's the evidence, that's the facts. But you know what? I've got nothing to lose and I've got everything to gain. So nevertheless, so what? At your word, I'm going to let down the net. And when he did, there was a miracle like he'd never seen. So nevertheless isn't just about trials. Nevertheless is about provision from God. Sometimes God wants to do it, but he's looking for somebody to believe in him to do it. There's one last scripture that Peter wrote, and I love this. He's writing in 2 Peter. It's toward the end of the first century. And Peter says this in chapter 3, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. The day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. And the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements are going to melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein will be burned up. And seeing that all these things are dissolved, what manner of people ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness and looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God? It's, it's disastrous. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Peter said, it's going to be a day of judgment and carnage. And you know what? There's something in the heart of the people of God that we know that that's coming. We, we can feel it. We read newspapers and we see media of all kinds. And, and we know that all the things that are messing with the world right now, somehow, even though we don't like it and it's uncomfortable and a little scary, it's in the plan of God. Because Jesus can't come and wind this up if the earth just keeps going on like it's gone on forever. So in the plan and in the mind of God, evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. In the mind and in the plan of God, there's going to be earthquakes in divers places and famine and pestilence and, and whatever. And sometimes it feels like we're an army and we're just pushing back and forth against the enemy. And really, that's what's happening. So plagues come and that's part of end time prophecy but we can pray over the people of God and we can pray over people that are sick and God can work a miracle right in the middle of the darkness just like he did for Israel when they were in the land of Egypt but prophecy just keeps pushing on us and there's no question no matter how much we pray no matter how faithful we are that the world is getting worse and worse and worse and worse and you can feel the pressure of the day that Peter's talking about judgment is coming Jesus is coming uh, the tribulation is on its way there's devastation and destruction and punishment for wickedness on its way and you can feel the pressure of prophecy and that's when Peter uses the word that he used at the seashore that day in the Gospel of Luke. He said, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we're not looking for antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. We're not looking for judgment. We're looking for heaven. We're not looking for destruction. We're looking for streets of gold. We're not looking for tribulation. We're not looking for the devil's power to be unleashed and unloosed. We're looking for a heaven and who's builder and maker is God. That's what we're looking for. So Peter said, I know it's rough and I know the coming of the Lord is pressing upon us and it's scary times to live in. But I've got one word. So what? I'm not looking at all of that when these things begin to come to pass. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. So I according to his promise, I'm looking for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Let the redeemed of the Lord look at the times we're in and say, so what? That doesn't scare me. That doesn't move me. That doesn't frighten me. That doesn't discourage me. It certainly doesn't turn me around. It certainly doesn't make me want to give up. It makes me want to look up. That's what it makes me want to do. Somebody say, nevertheless. Somebody shout, nevertheless. Every once in a while, you got to look back at the devil and your enemies, and you got to look back at opposition and circumstance. And the redeemed of the Lord have to say, so? I'm going to live for God regardless. Would you bow your head?
Before we come to the altar, pastor wants to pray over you. And then we're going to come, we're going to pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this great group of people. And I thank you, God, for their faith in your word. But Jesus, in an audience this size, there's people that are walking through all kinds of trouble, all kinds of circumstance. Some of them feel like they're walking through hell itself because the enemy is cruel and he's pressing in and he's pushing with with opposition against them. God, I pray that tonight you'd put some steel in the backbone of your children. I pray tonight that you'd renew our faith and our confidence in your word. I pray tonight that somebody that's walking through a fiery furnace trial, that they would say, I know Jesus can do it, but if Jesus doesn't do it, it doesn't make any difference to me. I'm still going to walk with him. I pray that that confidence would settle over the people of God right now in the name of Jesus. Let's stand together. And would you lift your hands this time and would you begin to pray one beside another, just prayer all over this building. Would you begin to pray? You might not need something for your trial, but I promise you, somebody in your row, they're walking through a trial. You might not need something for your circumstance, but I promise you, somebody in your row, they've got a circumstance that's rough and tough and frightening and scary, and they need the encouragement of the Spirit of the Lord tonight. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, whatever the devil does, However, he pushes against me. Nevertheless, my foundation stands sure. Nevertheless, I know whom I have believed. Nevertheless, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded that God's keeping the record books. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. There's just been such a wonderful spirit of prayer in this service. And we're going to take advantage of that right now. If, if I could just get in just a minute, I'm just going to ask everybody if you'd start worshiping again one more time. But I want dozens of people to just slip out of your seat and I want you to come to the altar. You're not coming because you've, you're giving up. You're coming because you're not giving up. You're not coming because you're mad at God. You're come, coming because in the middle of your trial, you are most decidedly not mad at God. You're still going to serve Him even though you don't understand Him that's who we're after. Now, we can pray for everybody, and everybody's welcome at the altar, but there's a special touch of God's Spirit for somebody in the middle of a trial that you don't understand. There's a special touch of God's Spirit in this room tonight for you. So, great church, would you lift up your hands, and would you begin to worship? Would you begin to worship with abandon? Would you begin to worship with volume? Would you begin to worship with enthusiasm? And I'm asking just dozens of people, slip out of where you're standing and come to the altar because God wants to touch you tonight. You may be in a trial. You may need a healing and you haven't gotten it yet. You may have opposition in your life that's very difficult to deal with. But God has a special touch for you tonight. God has a special touch for your family tonight. God has a special touch for your mind tonight. God has a special touch for your life tonight. Yes, yes. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, 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 Jesus. Just come in as close as you can. Let's make room for as many as we can get up here. They're still coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. My goodness, there's a powerful touch of the presence of God. Job said it best, but I say it today. Though he slay me, I'm still going to trust him. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know it. I'm confident in it. I'm confident in it. I know he lives. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. I can't explain what happened to me, but I can tell you I know who holds me in his hand, and that's the Lord of my salvation.